Hey guys, this is John. In the last couple of classic games we've looked at, the tactical fireworks have been abounding. And once again today, I have a doozy for you guys. This is a game played in Vienna in 1872 between Karl Hampe as white and Philip Meitner as black. And this is a relatively short game, but I think you'll agree that there was a lot of intrigue and much to calculate from both sides. I think you guys will like this one. I'm creating a chessable repertoire for this game as well with some notes. So if you would like to take a look at that, it's free, of course, and you can go and study that on chessable.com. So this game opened with e4. Black replied with e5. Hampe played knight c3. And Meitner replied with bishop to c5. This move is not so common. Knight f6 or knight c6 are more often played, just bringing out the knights. But I couldn't find a reason why bishop c5 is bad. And in fact, it creates some offensive chances for black already with the attack on f2. So Hampe decided to reply with a provocative move. So instead of developing another piece, like playing knight f3 or something, he plays knight a4, attacking the bishop on c5. And this is already breaking a couple rules, right? Moving the same piece twice in the opening, voluntarily putting the knight on the edge of the board. And perhaps that encouraged Meitner to respond with the move he did, which was bishop takes f2 check. No, this is not a crazy house game. Black really did sacrifice the bishop for a single pawn on move three. <laughs> not often you see that. White captures the bishop. And very often when this particular diagonal, the e1, h4 diagonal, is weakened in the opening, you'll see a queen make an appearance there. So black plays queen h4 check, forking the king on f2 and the pawn on e4. And the ways in which white can respond to this check are pretty limited. If g3 to block it, then queen takes e4 would fork the rook and the knight. This just wins a piece for black, or wins the piece back, I should say. If king e2, black will just take on e4 with check and win the piece back anyways. King f3 is quite dangerous because after the move d5, black opens up an attack on e4 once again, but also has bishop g4 check in mind with a skewer on the king and the queen. So this early on, the play is already quite forcing. So Hampe played the best move, king e3. And his opponent responded with queen f4 check, further driving the king. Hampe has to play king d3. And I have a feeling that Meitner had a nice feeling for the initiative. He seems like a natural attacking player to me. And remember, this game was played in the 1870s when there wasn't that much chess information out there. These guys had to make up stuff on their own. I mean, they might have had access to some chess resources, but much of what you see in these games is just up to the player's imagination. And Meitner played a great move. He played d5. When you have a open position and the short-term characteristics of the position favor you, you must open lines. You must play to maximize your pieces and maximize your tactical opportunities. Because if you don't, your, your opponent may have a chance to consolidate and those opportunities could slip away. So Meitner's not waiting around while white sorts out their king situation. No, he's opening lines. He doesn't really care if white takes the pawn because the knight on a4 would be hanging. Uh, also, you could imagine the bishop might make an appearance on f5. So the next several moves for both sides are not necessarily the best, but the only reason I know that is because I had my engine running and I was checking the accuracy of the player's moves. They weren't bad, but in this day and age, we can point out better moves. However, I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing that because uh, the position is already quite, quite complicated and... Honestly, I'm not sure I could even do better if I were white or black. <laughs> so, Hampe responded with king c3, trying to run away from the center. Meitner took the pawn on e4, attacking the knight. Hampe makes another king move, king b3, defending the knight. Note that black cannot check on c4 now because white's bishop does cover that square. So it's high time that black get more resources in the attack. So he plays knight a6. A decent attempt, I think, if you're going to try to get more pieces into the fray, because now black is threatening queen b4 checkmate, supported by the knight. Therefore, Hampe plays a3, covering that square, and also giving the king access to a2 in the future. So black to move. We're on move 9, and white's king is on b3. <laughs> so quite unusual. If you'd like to pause your video and try to predict what black played next, feel free to do that. So black to move, how do you think Meitner played?
Okay, so again, I think Meitner had great aggressive instincts and knew that if he dawdled here, white might escape. Technically, they're not threatening king a2 yet because the knight would be hanging, but maybe white has in mind to play knight c3 and then king a2. So in the spirit of his move 3, bishop takes f2 check, Meitner decides to up the ante again, and this time pretty significantly. He plays queen takes a4 check, sacrificing the queen. And this is an offer that Hampe can't really turn down. Playing king a2 is legal, but that's pretty craven, <laughs> and also just downright bad. So Hampe takes the queen, and now his king is on its own. Uh, there's no other pieces developed for white. It's solely the king. And since Meitner has sacrificed so much material, he's obliged to attack. And if the attack doesn't work out, who knows what will happen. Uh, most likely, black will just sputter out and lose as white's bringing their pieces into the equation. So Meitner plays knight c5 check. This prevents the king from coming back to b3. And here, Hampe had a choice. Uh, you can see that he has three legal king moves. King b4, king b5, and king a5. And he played the one that looks the most sane to me. He played king b4. Turns out that king b5 was the best move. And the engine gives this crazy line after king b5. It's best for black to ignore the attack on the knight and instead develop the other knight, knight e7, protecting the pawn on d5. And apparently, if white were to find the move c4 here, which is a total engine move, anyone who tells you that they can find such a move off the top of their head is lying. Uh, but if white were to find that, then the computers say that white is better. <laughs> Not crushing, but something like plus one or so in advantage. Uh, so you can't take the computer evals too seriously sometimes, especially in highly complex positions. Obviously, the computers are going to give you a pretty accurate assessment of highly complex positions, but you have to bear in mind that these are human players playing, and it's just so difficult to assess a position like this over the board. So not surprising that Hampe turned down king b5, knight e7, and then c4. So instead, he played king b4, which does still attack the knight and keeps the king back a little bit. And what does Meitner do? Does he move the knight? Of course not, no. He throws more wood on the fire. He plays a5 check. Go ahead and take my knight on c5. Now, retreating the king is dangerous for white. That's a theme in this game. Meitner gave white chances to retreat the king at various junctures, but it was almost never good to do so. If king c3, then d4 check could follow. Note that d3 and b3 are both covered by the black knight, so white would have to come forward with his king. And then just the quiet move, b6, gives white tremendous problems because this bishop is ready to make an appearance on either e6 or a6, and the knight on c5 is defended. So white is in big, big trouble here, possibly just losing. So therefore, after a5 check, Hampe has no choice. He must keep going forward. King takes c5, accepting the material. Now, if you sacrificed this amount of material early on, you parted with, what, your bishop, your queen, and now a knight. What are you going to do? Are you going to continue uh, playing vigorously and uh, throwing yourself at your opponent, trying to prove that you have compensation? I think that's what most of us would do. Or are you going to play a quiet move? <laughs> well, Meitner played a quiet move now. He plays knight to e7, just casually developing. This move is crucial, though, because he needs to defend the pawn on d5. If he were to simply keep checking the white king, just in the blind hope that uh, one of these checks leads to checkmate, well, he's not going to get anywhere. King takes d5, and this is a bit too much. Again, there, there can be some checks, but black is running out of things to throw at white, and white might just escape to safety. So knight e7, on the other hand, mature move that defends d5 and recognizes that white's king will still remain in the danger zone, and it's probably best just to ensure that he can't retreat. So... White does not have any of these uh, three retreat squares available to him. And in fact, it is now White who has to play very accurately if he wants to avoid losing. Because what is Black threatening? Uh, you might want to ask yourself that question. After knight e7, what does Black have in mind? And if you want to pause your video and figure that out, you can do so now. Okay, so it's a checkmate in two. Let's say white plays 
some developing move like knight f3. Black can play b6 check. White would have to play king b5, only safe square. And now bishop d7 is checkmate because the a4 square is also covered. And white cannot go to a6 covered by the rook. So knight e7 has a concrete threat in mind, b6 and bishop d7, even though this does look like a slow move. So white only has one way to proceed. And it turns out that he must block this e8, a4 diagonal. He has to make sure that black's bishop does not come here, make an appearance with check or checkmate. So Hampe, to his credit, finds bishop b5 check. Maybe that move's not so tough to find. Just slowing black down for the moment. Meitner responds with king to d8. And now this move is very impressive by white. This was a, a strong defense and the only defensive move. And before I show it, maybe you want to try to find it. So white to move. What do you think Hampe should play? All right, so we know what the threat is. It's still b6. And in this case, white doesn't even have b5 available. So a bishop move makes sense. It's just where to put the bishop. If we go to a4, then it's going to lead to the same checkmate. b6 check, king b5, bishop d7, or even bishop a6. So the move that works is bishop to c6. Putting the bishop on a square where it can be captured in two different ways. But most importantly, giving the b5 square and stopping the bishop from coming here with check. So Meitner plays another check, b6. White replies with king to b5. And now again, uh, you might think that black would want to continue the checks, but he just decides to take the bishop. He plays knight takes c6. The attack is seemingly proceeding in slow motion, right? But after knight takes c6, white's position is still pretty dire. The threat this time is knight d4 check, king a4, and then bishop d7. And if white were to cover the d4 square, let's say with a move like knight f3, black could just invert the order of moves and play bishop to d7 first. And that king is not a happy camper. This bishop again is lurking, and there's a discovered attack mate threat, knight d4, among other knight moves. Like even knight b4 would suffice there. So... White cannot relax one bit, even though black is playing another seemingly slow move. Knight takes c6. So there's only one thing to do, and that's to keep coming forward into the lion's den. So Hampe plays, king takes c6. And here is the culmination of the game. Because Meitner had to foresee the consequences of his previous play. So black to move. Black has sacrificed his queen his dark square bishop, both of his knights, but he's dragged the king out to c6 with no defenders around. No defenders in sight. But what to do now? So if you want to pause your video and try to figure out what black should play, feel free to do that now. Okay, only moves have been the theme of the play over the past several moves. And here again, Black found an only move, the only move that keeps him in the game and avoids losing. So he played bishop to b7 check, protecting the pawn on d5. You can see that bishop d7 check, by contrast, would just be bad because after king takes d5, white's king can hustle back. Actually, he could probably even keep his king in the center for now because black is just running out of ways to attack. But bishop b7 check, on the other hand, defends this pawn and says, hey, go ahead and take my bishop. And let's investigate what happens if king takes b7. Because the way the game is going, you might think that white just continued and um, proceeded to snatch material once again. But here, king takes b7 is going to lose because of the very nice reply, king to d7. This enables the rooks to communicate, and black is threatening rook h to b8 checkmate. Note that c6 and a6 are covered. So rook h to b8 checkmate. And even throwing in queen g4 check is not going to matter. The black king comes up to d6 where it's perfectly safe. White has a spike check or a queen move they can throw in like queen c8. But this rook is inevitably coming to b8 and white will be checkmated within a couple moves. So bishop b7, the bishop is untouchable. White loses if they take it. So therefore, Hampe played the only move, king b5. Again, trying to make a dash for it and retreat. 
And here, Meitner responded with bishop to a6 check. Now, <laughs> this might have come as a disappointment to white, but he can't play king a4 because after bishop to c4, a quiet move, if you're noticing a pattern here, <laughs> bishop to c4, taking away the b3 square, b5 checkmate is coming no matter what. We seal off the exit for the king and mate with the pawn. So what happened after bishop a6? Well, Hampe went right back. He played king back into c6, attacking the pawn on d5. And right around here, I'm sure both players realize that it's too risky for either side to play for a win and be justified in doing so. Uh, like maybe Meitner thought for a second about playing bishop c4 here to support the pawn, but without a clear way to attack that king, that would be exceedingly risky. You know, here queen g4 actually threatens mate on d7, and black doesn't have a good check to throw at white, so this would lose for black. So sensibly, after king to c6, Meitner played uh, bishop to b7 check, and a draw was agreed, because the players recognized that it would be a perpetual. King b5, bishop a6 once more. So 18 moves and a draw by agreement. Uh, phenomenal game and a really incredible king march by white that uh, did not result in white getting checkmated. And both sides had to show great ingenuity uh, to kind of demonstrate their ideas. Black demonstrating compensation for all the sacrifice material and white demonstrating their defensive prowess, especially in finding that very nice bishop to c6 move here on move 14. The only move that works, blocking the bishop d7 check idea. So I think this is a very fun game to analyze. Lots of tactical ideas that cropped up even as early as move two, or sorry, move three with bishop takes f2 check. And I couldn't resist showing this to you. It's called the immortal draw game. And I also like the fact that this was an immortal game that didn't end in a re decisive result. There are lots of draws in chess, and just because the players split a half point does not mean that the game isn't exciting, as we saw in this encounter. And despite some of the improvements that I was kind of alluding to, especially in the position uh, right around here uh, that the computer advocates, I think both players played at an incredibly high level, especially if you take into account the year this was played, 1872. So well done to Carl Hampe and Philip Meitner. And thank you to those players for uh, a fabulous game that we can now review in 2016 and beyond. Anyways, I will be publishing a chessable repertoire on this game, as I mentioned, with some notes. So cruise over there and commit this game to memory and read my notes if you like. And thank you guys for watching. If you have any questions, feel free to leave it in the comments. And I'll be back soon with another classic game analysis. Thanks, guys. Bye.